Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Mishpacha, thanks for joining us for another episode of Messy Antics. Uh, today, we are actually going to be responding to a question that was sent in to us on our Facebook page. And again, we want to encourage you to uh, to please send those in to us so that we can interact with questions you may have and not just thoughts we think you want to know about. But with that said, I'm going to read the question. This actually comes from Joe. It says, hey, Messy Antics team, I have a question for you. I think it's really cool that we're a Messy Antics team, by right? the way. <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. He says, hey, Messy Antics team, I have a question for you. High Holy Days uh, are approaching, and the question I have is, should Messianic Jews and Gentiles recite Kol Nidre? And if so, why or why not? Uh, And so I just want to kind of take some time to dive into this. For those that maybe are listening to this and have no clue what in the world Kol Nidre is or why we're talking about it, Kol Nidre is a uh, liturgical piece that is said at the very beginning of Erev Yom Kippur, uh, the very beginning of the, the the evening of Yom Kippur, and there's a special service in synagogue specifically for the Kol Nidre. Uh, and so I'm going to read just a quick kind of summation of Kol Nidre, why we say it, what it is, um, and I'm going to read actually kind of a translation of the text. It says, all vows we are likely to make, all oaths and pledges we are likely to take between this Yom Kippur and the next Yom Kippur we publicly renounce. Let them all be relinquished and abandoned, null and void, neither firm nor established. Let our vows, pledges, and oaths be considered neither vows nor pledges nor oaths. Essentially, Kol Nidre, in its various forms, is our last-ditch plea to God to acknowledge our human frailty and our inability to live perfectly ethically and to forgive us of our moments of shoving unethical foots in our collective mouths throughout the year. Emotionally, Kol Nidre's contour uh, feels a bit like a small child recognizing his wrongs and begging his parents for forgiveness because he finally knows what he did was wrong and promises that he'll do his best to do better next time. Time. For Jews who go to synagogue all year and those who come only for the high holy days, the literal meaning in the chant in, is less important than uh, that which it symbolizes. The words and music and ultimate teshuva or for repentance and the forgiveness and ultimately return to closeness with God that comes with that. Essentially, the chant has a role to play that is greater than the sum of its parts. It is a musical moment that has come to symbolize ultimate teshuvah uh, or return towards God. Apparently, no matter the words or the legal basis, we really want the chance to experience that moment. Uh, I believe that they uh, miss the point of Kol Nidre, the, the outside world. There's a lot of anti-Semitic uh, uh, hatred towards the Kol Nidre because of a lack of understanding of it. I believe that they they miss the point of Kol Nidre uh, and the function of the prayer altogether. Prayer is more than a recitation of words on a page. Uh, while not ir- the the words, while not irrelevant, are the superficial expression of a heartfelt supplication. The music of Kol Nidre is a melody which universally touches the deepest recesses of our hearts and our souls. When we are blessed with the occasion of listening to soul-penetrating renditions of Kol Nidre, each of us feels our spiritual facade begin to dissipate, while the gate to our truest self gently opens. On Yom Kippur, we are preparing to bring our most vulnerable core to stand humbly before the judgment of God. That does not come easily. In order to break through and allow for internal revelation, we uh, we need a kavanah, an intention of heart, that begins by subtly Coax, uh, coaxing our minds and concludes with a shameful uh, with, and concludes with a resounding push to expose ourselves, both our proudest gifts and our shameful misgivings. Kol Nidre is that invitation, the invitation to share, to be open, and to prepare for repentance. The music, coupled with the atmosphere of the night and the communal bond, give us the permission to begin uh, serious self introspection, to seek genuine forgiveness from God, and to contemplate practical ways for self improvement. And and one thing to note with Kol Nidre as well, one of the re- 
reasons why there is this kind of anti-Semitic slant and this assumption that uh, that that Kol Nidre is the the Jewish person's effort to try and get out of holding their word up to other people um, is because it's a complete misunderstanding of the purpose of Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre isn't about your vows or your promises or your oaths made to another person. If I make a a vow to or a promise to Rabbi Eric, uh, it isn't. I, I don't say Kol Nidre to go. Okay, now I'm out of that because I I I uh, said Kol Nidre, so I don't have to worry about it. It has nothing to do with vows that we make to other people. It has to do with vows that we make to God. Um, and uh, and so I think it's important that we understand that that is the primary forefront thought of the Kol Nidre as we be- begin this discussion. Right. The, the Kol Nidre, for those that are listening, means all vows. And the prayer itself talks about vows and oaths. And we have to remember that vows and oaths are different things. Uh, actually, when we say what we call our wedding vows, it's actually a wedding oath because an oath is promising to do something and a vow is promising not to do something. So, for instance, if I were to say I'm not going to eat chocolate for a month, chocolate eating is not a sin by itself. Sounds like a terrible idea, though. It, it would be, but chocolate eating is not a sin by itself. But if I make a uh, a vow to not eat chocolate for a month, and then I eat chocolate, then I have sinned because I made a vow to God that I was not going to do something. Likewise, if I make an oath to do something, then we have the obligation to do what we've said, and it becomes a sin not to do what we said, even if the action itself would not be a sin not to do. So it's important to remember that a Nazarite vow is a vow not to do something. Uh, It's a vow, not an oath. So we have to understand those things. And when we make an oath to God, uh, these things are real, and and we're held accountable to that. But as Rabbi David said, it's not a... uh, Kol Nidre is not erasing our promises to each other in human sense. It's only asking Hashem, asking God to forgive us for the vows that we've made. And interestingly enough, Kol Nidre asks Hashem, asks God to forgive us for vows and oaths, even if we kept those things, because it's a it's against our faith actually to make a vow hastily without uh, prayer consideration and actually hearing from Hashem. For instance, there are people that say, "I want to make a Nazarite vow today." Well, first of all, we can't make Nazarite vows today because there's no temple and priesthood, and the way to get out of a vow is to make a sacrifice, an offering, uh, go to the priest, deal with all of the rituals to get us out of the vow. So you can't end a Nazarite vow now, so we don't make them. But there are people that want to uh, make one because they have a desire or they have a thought. But in order to make a vow such as that, it has to be something that God speaks to us to do, and then we come in agreement with God. For instance, uh, Samson was uh, in a Nazarite vow, but it was because God himself spoke to his parents to establish that. And so it wasn't just that Samson's parents decided we're going to make him a Nazarite Uh, And we're going to do this, but God speaks it into the hearts of his people, and they respond and join with him in that vow or that oath. We're not supposed to make vows and oath of our own accord or haphazardly or hastily at all. And so even if we fulfill a vow that we made outside of the scope of how we're supposed to do it biblically, we still ask God to forgive us for making that vow or that oath without being— in concert with him. Yeah, and talking about, and just like you talked about Samson uh, in Scripture with the Nazarite vow, uh, which was obviously something that God had uh, had had uh, initiated. You have uh, examples of what you just said earlier, which is, uh, by the way, this is Rabbi Toby. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan is not with us today, and we miss him, by the way. Yeah, he's taking care of his sick baby. Uh, his, and when I say sick baby, uh, Rabbi Jonathan and his lovely wife Catherine have a brand new born baby. And uh, I say brand new, it's a couple months old now. But uh, he got his very first cold uh, last week. And this has become a very big event for them. 
Right. As you can imagine, brand new parents with a baby. This is the first high, reasonably high fever. They're taking care of it. So now their little baby has passed the cold on to Jonathan. Right. So now Catherine is taking care of Jonathan and the baby. And so uh, just uh, say a prayer for Catherine, for Jonathan, for their little baby. But that's why he's not here. This yeah. is a big event for a new parent, <laughs> right, is that very first sickness in the baby. Yeah. So I just want to mention that before we keep going. But uh, just going back to what I was saying, so uh, you mentioned, Samson, how God can initiate – God initiates the vow, and we we respond. But then you have King David in First Samuel 25 – when he is on the run from Saul, and he uh, he encounters Nabal, he sends his men t- to Nabal to ask for help, and Nabal refuses. And David's response is, "May God deal deal with me severely if I don't cut Nabal and every one of his men down." Now, Abigail intervenes, Nabal's wife. Abigail intervenes and stops David, and David says, "Oh, praise God that you have come." And stopped me from avenging myself. So David relents. Uh, the fact is, uh, even though it was right for David to relent, David did make a rash oath to God. He said, may God deal with me severely if I don't kill all these men. Uh, so this is the man after God's own heart who we see um, he holds his hand back from killing Saul, but then, you know, turn around here he is, he's enraged, and he's ready to, to hack all these men to death. So you have your good days and bad days. But that's just an example, I think, of what you mentioned as a rash oath. Right, um, exactly. And and we have to look at these things through a, the right lens. Uh, first of all, Kol Nidre comes about somewhere around the 7th century. We're dealing with a time when the Inquisition is going on, when Jews are being forced to recant their faith uh, in, in public for going through these things. And so the Kol Nidre is recited today in either Aramaic or in Hebrew, but it's leading back to that. And when I share at my congregation about it, I say, look, we're saying this not only to ask God to forgive us for any vows or oaths we rashly made and for getting back in line with him the way we should be spiritually, supernaturally, powerfully through the Ruach, but also in connection with the fact that we uh, will that we are not being put in a position where we're being you know held a sword to our neck or or a guillotine and being told that uh, that if we don't renounce our faith we're going to be killed and hopefully we'll never be in that situation but if we are may we be willing to give up our lives so that we don't make a vow or an oath to not follow our faith. And it's important to add to this as well that while for a lot of people uh, maybe new to Messianic Judaism uh, or or those who didn't grow up in a a Jewish context and are just kind of starting to learn about Messianic Judaism that are still plugged into churches or what have you and just want to know a little more about it that may be listening to us today, um, I I, I want to point out that while we think about this, and, and as I said earlier, there's a lot of kind of anti-Semitic um, uh Yeah, if you look distrust. online, you'll see all yeah. kinds of garbage related to Kol Nidre yeah. that's anti-Semitic that mm-hmm. says Jews actually have a prayer that they can say at the beginning of the year asking God to forgive them for all the lies they're going to tell to yeah, their right. Gentile business partners and stuff over the year, and, which is ridiculous. And even more so, tracing it back to the Inquisition, the reality is is that the the Spanish Inquisition and and, and many other scenarios uh, before and after that forced uh, caused forced Jewish conversions to to Catholicism to Christianity um, and literally by the sword to the throat and so Kol Nidre was a prayer that developed around that same time uh, historically this is what we were thinking as as Rabbi Ike was saying about the seventh century eighth century somewhere around there uh, it, it developed and it became an opportunity for those who we now know as conversos or uh, uh, as uh, Mar- Muranos uh, that the, it gave their family opportunity as they were forced to convert to go you know God forgive me for this this, this is for my life because you got to understand in uh, a, a Torah lifestyle uh, and, and in Jewish tradition, it's always life over law. 
you always save life even at the cost of breaking a commandment, even at the cost of breaking a mitzvah. You always save life, life. no matter what. And so life over law, if that means that my family or myself is going to die unless I give in to this uh, conquistador sword to my throat, or, or I don't even know that it was conquistadors involved in that, but it just seemed like it was a funny word to use there, so it fit. But uh, you know, if, if it's my family or myself, my own life, or I say this thing they want me to say and eat the ham, sandwich they're throwing in my face to prove I'm really converted in Christianity, uh, the the Torah, to some degree, it can be argued, allows for you to save that life and then repent before the Lord for the the, the rash right. vow that was made. And that's where the Kol Nidre's concept comes from. And and at the same time that Jews were being forced to convert, there were there were also those in that, that were forcing them to convert that were then running around saying, but they say the Kol Nidre. And so you can't trust their conversion. They're not really Christians. You can't trust their conversion because they're 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 doing this. But it's interesting because we in the the twenty was this twenty first century still uh, I don't know why my brain went to twenty second century in the twenty first century we have this mindset that we're like so far removed from all of this stuff and so far removed from the idea of of vows and oaths made to God and so on and so forth it's like this archaic sounding thing. But we do it all the time, whether we realize it or not. You know, God, if you just get me through this test, I promise you I'll spend every morning in prayer before uh, before I go to school. God, if you just get me this promotion that I need, I promise I'll tithe faithfully like right. I'm supposed to. If God, you'll if you fix my marriage, I'll be at synagogue every Shabbat. Exactly. We make these things all the time, and we know good and well that odds are 99.97% of them we're never going to keep. Right. But we try anyways. Yeah, and right? another aspect of the Kol Nidre we need to remember is that it's said on Yom Kippur. Now, we're right now in the time between Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur. Yeah, we're in what's yeah, known as the Days of Awe. And in this time, we're supposed to be making repentance between ourselves and other people. This is a time we're supposed to be preparing our hearts. We're supposed to be going to one another and saying, if I've offended you or if I've hurt you, please forgive me. Uh, and that's in preparation. You know, the scripture says if you have, if someone has ought against you, you're supposed to go to them, leave your uh, all, gift at the altar, go to them, make repentance, make restoration with them, and then bring your offering to the altar. That's the season we're in right now as we're supposed to be going to one another and doing that. But on Yom Kippur... We transition from repentance to people to repentance to Adonai, to repentance to God. Right. And we're not only repenting for ourselves, which in in the Bible-believing world, in Christianity, largely when we talk about repentance, we're talking about individual. We're talking about my personal relationship with God. But biblically, we have to deal with two different aspects. Mm-hmm. It's not only the repentance of me individually— but it's the repentance of me corporately as part of Israel, which is why Paul refers to the Gentile believers as part of the commonwealth of Israel. They become grafted into the whole. Right. And so when we say kol nidre, we're not only saying it in case we made a vow or an oath, but we're saying it corporately as Israel. As Israel, did we make vows or oaths uh, haphazardly that we need to repent of as yeah. a unit? Because on kol, on a Yom Kippur, an offering was made for the nation, Mm -hmm. not for the individuals. It's the corporate acceptance of of repentance and uh, and atonement provided for Israel. I want want to just jump in real quick and say I always find it funny the random times your brain, like, automatically converts to the KJV. Yeah. If you have aught with your brother, ought, what, who even says that? Like, that's such a weird thing. I was, like, I was listening and following, but I was like... Listen, listen, I'm old enough that the Bible, I just, you know, before it was in Hebrew and Greek, it was in the King James I, I Version. I figured, I was like, I'm sure that means if you have an issue, yeah, but I'm for, just going to... For, for the record, that was a joke. Yeah. It, it was not the KJV first. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, Before anybody comes at us on that one. But I, I know that, and, and I'm glad we spent um, a, a good portion of time uh, really building a foundation of what Kol Nidre is. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I guess to get to the question, though. Yep. I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. Should we say it? Should yeah. it be said in a Messianic congregation? Yes. I think yes. And, and we do at our congregation, but we also – expound like we're doing on this podcast we also introduce the prayer 
by saying, look, this is not an excuse to lie. This is an, not an excuse to enter into contracts or covenants you're not planning on keeping. This is not any of that. This is not dealing with you and mankind. This is dealing between you and Hashem yep. and asking him to forgive you for any vows. And I think in, in our congregation, we do Kol Nidre as well. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I love it. I mean, it's just such a powerful prayer. And as I was reading earlier, that that's actually from a handout that we give out in our congregation uh, on Kol Nidre, uh, at our Kol Nidre service on Yom Kippur, uh, specifically so we don't have to deal with these these conversations uh, uh, on that evening, at least. I don't mind dealing with them later on. Um, and uh, we do the same thing. Like We put it in context. I think Messianic Judaism uh, can take great value from something like Kol Nidre because it's a powerful reminder. And, uh, and actually, what's interesting is Joe's question uh, that he sent to us. He actually talks about how his rabbi that he grew up with, uh, a Messianic Jewish rabbi that he grew up with, connects it to, to Peter's uh, denial of Yeshua. Uh, and you know, if you if you look at the story of Peter's denial of Yeshua, Yeshua tells him in advance, "Hey, you're going to do this. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, before the sun comes up, before the next day. You're going to deny me three times." He said, "Never, never would I do it, even if they had a, a sword in my throat." I'm paraphrasing. And he makes but, a vow. Yeah, he says, "Never would I do it." Uh, uh, you know, exactly. He makes a vow uh, that uh, to God that he would never do this, and then almost immediately. Almost immediately, I think it's actually John's gospel that that brings this up, and I think it's like the most eerie thought out of all of the the Bible, is it says that he was approached by somebody and said, oh, you're one of his dudes, aren't you? And no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't even know the guy. And again and again, three times it happens, and as soon as he says it the third time, rooster crows, and immediately Yeshua, who's on trial turns and looks at him and locks eyes. Could you imagine being Peter, yeah, who every, just made this vow to God, I would never do that, and, and then does it, and immediately Yeshua locks eyes with you? And it's interesting that we, when we actually chant, when, when the Kol Nidre is sung, it's sung three times. Yeah. It's sung because it is a corporate prayer. It's sung for uh, the Kohanim, the Levites, and the Israelites. It, it gets more meaningful and, and and, and sorrowful as it goes along, but it's interesting that this connection to this vow and Kol Nidre being done three times and the connection to Peter three times denying yep. before he realizes yep. that his vow was broken. And it's important to note the connection of because you got to understand all Jewish tradition – it, it's not like we just plug pluck random stuff out of thin air. Like it has an intentional purpose, right? So our our prayer services every day. You know, you've got three uh, prayer services every day. There's actually four, but you've got pre th- three prayer services every day that are are like everybody participates in, uh, and those prayer services are based off of the temple service right. and it, it, the prayers that are said at that time. Uh, in each of those services are directly connected to the type of service that occurred in the morning, in the early afternoon, and the, the the evening. Uh, it, it's connected to all of that, and it's for our hearts, uh, the, the kavanah, the intention of the heart to focus on uh, kind of like Paul says, a living sacrifice before the Lord. We're connecting to the temple service and, and that, and the same is true with Kol Nidre. Like it didn't come out of nowhere, but even more important, uh, Rabbi Eric talked about how it said three times, and it you know for the the Kohanim, for the Levites, for for Israel. Well, on Yom Kippur, guess what happens? There are sacrifice for the Kohanim's atonement. There's sacrifice for the Levi's atonement, there's sacrifice for the entire nation's atonement. Uh, and, and so it's all tied together and it's all this beautiful image. Uh, and, and I jokingly say it at Maim Chaim all the time when we talk about something like this that all kind of comes together in this beautiful package. It's, just like, it's, it's almost like God knew what he was doing. It's kind of yeah, crazy. It's interesting thought. that Paul tells us to hold on to the traditions that were passed down to us. So just like, you know, I, every once in a while I'll see somebody post on Facebook or whatever and they'll say, you know, I don't have religion, I have relationship. When the Lord tells us that good religion is is, is good. Relationship. <laughs> yeah, it's relationship. Good religion is good, bad religion is bad. Good traditions are good, bad traditions yeah, are bad. Right. So these are traditions that are good and hold value and unify us to hold us together as a people. Um, for me, uh, of course, I believe that it is still very much something we should do in a Messianic synagogue. Um, and we've pretty much already answered the question several times, but just, you know, uh, I'll share the reason why is now, no, as you said, Rabbi Eric, I don't know what it's like. And I'm, I'm, I've been blessed, uh, to not know what it's like to deal with forced conversion, to have a knife to my throat. 
However, um, I can still apply Cole Nidre to me personally because I am still a promise breaker. Mm-hmm. Um, even after coming to Messiah, even though I'm covered uh, by the blood of Messiah, I'm under the new covenant. Um, I still have a fallen nature, as yep. as uh, Yaakov says, James. Um, we all struggle in many ways, and um, and also to to the point you made, uh, it is if anybody thinks that Cole Nidre is an excuse to say, okay, I'm going to say this, and that gets me out of this, and I'm going to, or it's no different than saying I'm going to I'm going to apply the blood of Yeshua because it's going to get me out of this, so I can go and do it again. Uh, that person needs to be reeducated on the gospel and. That that that's a, a very immature and incredibly um, inaccurate and just flat out wrong way to look at the Lord and and why Yeshua did what he did, why God sent the Messiah. Uh, there, there is one thing, I, and I want to bring up another tradition uh, for this time period for the Yamim Noraim, the the ten days of awe as we lead up to Yom Kippur, uh, that I think is very important and one that probably a lot of people outside of Jewish culture really may not understand. Uh, and that is that uh, one of the primary themes that you'll see leading up to Yom Kippur is Jewish people approaching their friends, their family, their coworkers, and asking for forgiveness for anything we may have done to offend them or that caused them harm or hurt or whatever, even the stuff we may not know, right? Like, I, my dad and I are both super sarcastic people, and uh, and I have no, no I have no filter whatsoever. And so it's very common that somebody will say something to me, and the, the first sarcastic thought that comes in my head, I start to say, and a lot of times it doesn't even register. Oh, wait, maybe they didn't take that as sarcasm. Maybe that kind of came across as they thought I was being serious and it hurt them. Yeah, David's and so, caution light doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. blinking. It's just behind me instead uh, of in front of me. But uh, And so one of the things that we see in Jewish culture leading up to Yom Kippur is that we'll approach our friends, our family, and, and because of the implementation of social media now, I always think it's funny when you see like these, these uh, uh, whitewash posts on social media. Please forgive me as Yom Kippur approaches. Please forgive me if I I've ever done anything wrong by you. I'm like, you know, that's great. That's cool. You know, you're trying, but there, it loses that kind of personal touch to it. But this is a very important, especially as followers of Yeshua, it's a very important concept because this is a Yeshua central concept, the idea of seeking forgiveness of others, right? So in Matthew 6, Yeshua was asked what's the most important, uh, uh, or not what's the most, what, how do we pray, right? The, the, the disciples come to you, how do we pray? How do we formulate a prayer? What's it supposed to look like? And so in, in the Christian world, it's kind of become liturgical. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we use it in our service to set up the Amidah uh, because the, uh, the the what's called the Lord's Prayer is very closely built upon, in a lot of ways, the Amidah. They're very closely related with each other um, and, and so on. And the Amidah, for the most part, was already existent in Yeshua's day. Uh, so there, there's a very close relationship there. Um, and so in the what's called the Lord's Prayer, it says, uh, Yeshua says, pray this way, our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then uh, a lot of translations, not all manuscripts, but a lot of translations say, for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Um, and, and everybody likes to, to stop there, right? Because that's, that's the model. That's the formulation of prayer that God has given us, that Yeshua has given us. So this is how we're supposed to pray. And they just stop there, right? And everybody will quote, quote that, but nobody quotes the next two verses, which are just as important and are actually set up the foundation of exactly what Yeshua was dealing with. Because the next two verses, Matthew 6, verse 14, for if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. And so as we approach Yom Kippur, there is this this tradition within Jewish culture to approach uh, our loved ones, our friends, our, uh, our, our coworkers, et cetera, personal relationships in personal ways and say, I don't know if I have or haven't pretty fair bet that I have in some way or another hurt you over the last year or done something to offend you over the last year. Will you please forgive me? And likewise, if we know somebody has hurt us for us to go to them, because Yeshua says in Matthew 18, if somebody is, has, if, if somebody has ought you, no, if somebody has done something against you, if somebody has hurt you, wronged you, go to them and tell them, right? Uh, uh, and so in the same sense that it's important for us to walk up and ask for forgiveness, we should also walk up to people and offer forgiveness because, again, they may not know they hurt us. And we right. may be carrying wounds and, and offenses that we shouldn't even carry, but we just hang on right. to them without even realizing there's nothing there. 
there. And so I want to encourage uh, everyone as we approach Yom Kippur to take this to heart and to uh, and to, to to personally approach people and 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 uh, ask for forgiveness, offer forgiveness. Absolutely, we have this time between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur that's designed for us to. Uh, apologize to one another, to repent to one another, to seek forgiveness for one another before we go to Hashem and ask Him to forgive us uh, when we recite the Kol Nidre and so on. And remember that... We and with that, Yeshua says, as you forgive, as, you right. will be forgiven. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we look at this in the in the scope of personal redemption and corporate redemption... It goes all the way back to where the second sin we read about in the Bible, the first one is Adam and Eve and the fall in the garden, but the second one is Cain and Abel, and and Cain's response to God is, am I my brother's keeper? And the reality is we pray corporately because we are our brother's keeper, because we do have a corporate responsibility that holds up. So uh, I want to remind you guys that if you have any questions or comments or whatever, you can go to our Facebook page like Joe did and and uh, post a question for us to answer in the future. I also want to bring up that in our future uh, podcast, we are going to discuss the Lord's Prayer, which actually wasn't a prayer the Lord prayed, but more something for the disciples. And it wasn't a prayer the disciples prayed, but more a model for prayer. Yeah. And we'll we'll do an upcoming episode on that that I think you'll find fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I was gonna. I wanted to finish my thought from previously. Um, I I truly believe, you know, continuing my thought about yes, we should do Kol Nidre uh, because again, we're still promise breakers. Uh, we all struggle in different ways, and um, I think it's important to, even though God is available to us twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days a year, we don't have to do it during. We can do it in April, May, June, July. Um, it, it's it's always great to stop during a time that God appoints, and and to uh, to, to you know c- repent to confess sins, and um, uh, yeah. So, but at the same time, even though I do believe Kol Nidre has a personal application, I think it is important to still share the history of it. Even though I don't know what it's like to be under forced conversion, I think. Everybody in Messianic Judaism needs to understand the history of the adversary trying to destroy the Jewish people. Absolutely. Because if he can do that, which we know he won't because God made a promise, but he still has tried throughout history. Every major empire, every major civilization has attempted to destroy the Jewish people. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think it's important to understand that history. Um, And yes, to to, uh, to David's point about, about... confessing your sins and repenting to others for heaven's sakes if you can go to a person face to face that is the way to do it not a facebook blast not dropping a postcard in a mailbox and driving off <laughs> uh, this is yep. what people do yeah. you know yeah. because because for some reason it's easy to go to god but standing and, before people it's and for those of us that are rabbis and pastors don't stand up in front of your entire congregation to offer your forgiveness to somebody that's wronged you in the crowd like just go talk to them uh, and the same thing, like, don't stand up there and just, you know, ask everybody to forgive you. Go talk to them. Go. Right, and don't piously, Yeah, I want you to know that I'm so spiritual that I'm right. asking your yeah. forgiveness of me for all. Go to the people one-on-one. And now that we've now that we've kind of hit this because it brings up the next few verses in Matthew six that yeah. I had no intention of covering, but I think fits perfectly into this this, this discussion of Yom Kippur, uh, because one of the things that that Rabbi Eric and I have joked about for years is uh, how people will come up to you in, in Jewish culture. It's very common, uh, especially in America, in American Jewish culture, for people to come up to you on Yom Kippur, leading up to Yom Kippur, and and they'll say, "What what is it we say?" Have an easy fast. Have a good, no, don't have an easy fast. Have a miserable yeah, fast. <laughs> have a fast that makes you contemplate all of the mistakes you've made in life and all of your poor choices because that's what it's for. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 16 says, And whenever you fast, do not become sad faced like the hypocrites, for they neglect their faces to make their fasting evident to men. Amen, I tell you, they have their reward in full, but when you fast, anoint your head. Wash your face so that your fasting won't be evident to men, but to your father 
father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Which is interesting because it's totally opposite of tradition today in modern Judaism, where on Yom Kippur, you don't shave, you don't put on cologne or deodorant, you don't... You don't wear comfortable clothes, you sit on the floor. You sit on a hard seat, you, (laughs) you do... So when Yeshua said, when you fast... Don't look yeah. like you're fasting. Yeah. In tradition, when when we fast on Yom Kippur, according to the tradition, you you're supposed to look miserable yeah. as you're doing it, which is contrary to how it yeah. should be done. And, and let's right. be honest: if you're in a synagogue on Yom Kippur, odds are everybody else in the room is fasting, so you don't need to tell people you're hungry. Like you know, and and I'm guilty of this too. Like, don't get me wrong. This is because a lot of times we don't think before we say something. Somebody will walk up on Yom Kippur. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, especially you like halfway through service on on the morning. Hey, how you doing? You do. I'm hungry. Other than that, I'm good. Uh, no, yeah. Stop it. Like yeah. you're so, everybody's hungry. You're supposed to be hungry. You so haven't with, eaten within since this dinner. Podcast, You'll be okay. Within this podcast, we've given an example of a good tradition, the Kol Nidre. And a bad tradition, how we act when we're fasting as tradition in Judaism today. Anyhow, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. It's been a blessing. If you haven't already, I hope you'll subscribe to our channel, that you'll share this on your social media. And if you have a question or a comment, please post it on our Facebook page, Messy Antics Podcast. And we thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.